Welcome. After six long years, the time has finally come. After unprecedented pressures on hospitals created by COVID, breakthrough discussions of race and equity, and the galvanizing power of 988, we stand uh, at the starting line. Hi, my name is David Covington. I'm the CEO and president of RI International, a member of the Five Lanes Crisis Partners family of companies, and your host for today's special edition, 988 Goes Live, Crisis Jam. Uh, we're thrilled today to have as our featured presenter, uh, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman, Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use in the US Department of Health and Human Services, and the leader of the uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, Dr. Delphin Rittman has been a kind and fierce champion of better crisis care. And today we celebrate the work that's been done and uh, the work that's remaining to do. Uh, July 16th is a watershed moment. And the first step towards everyone in crisis care, uh, getting care that feels like care when and where they need it. Uh, and I'd like to give a special thanks and recognition to our partners, uh, partners at NAMI and the Reimagine Crisis Initiative, which uh, very much inspired the theme for today. Uh, the formal launch of 988 is a vital starting line, uh, but the, the phrase from the uh, Reimagine Crisis, the work to provide crisis care is just, just beginning. Uh, we continue to grow this learning community. Almost 3,000 of you are now involved and we'll have 300 to 400 in the Zoom meeting every week with many of you watching the video if you missed it on the uh, learning community homepage at talk.crisisnow.com where you can get a link to the meeting as well as sign up for the weekly newsletter and see all of the materials or again, watch, uh, watch or rewatch one of our, of our episodes. Uh, we want to start today's news section with something that will be in the news, quote unquote, uh, this Saturday. Uh, Hannah Wazalowski from NAMI, uh, welcome. Uh, give us a brief uh, on what you at NAMI and the Reimagine Crisis Partners are doing Saturday. Thanks, David, and thank you so much for, for having me, and, and thank you to you for your team's leadership in Nashville, and of course, our, our wonderful partners at SAMHSA. This is such an exciting week. This Saturday, this open letter is going to be in the Washington Post, again, to celebrate how far we've come with 988 and that it is now available on starting Saturday everywhere in the country, but also to remind everyone that we have more work to do. The work is just beginning. Um, so I, we will share the final ad with you all. We'll, we'll share it with David and team to see if we can get it out. Um, we encourage you to use it in your advocacy efforts. Uh, we want to remind everyone that there is a lot more investment and continued work that is going to be needed in the months and years to come. And we need to celebrate this moment in time, but we need to keep working toward our goal. So this is one effort that we have in place to do that. And we just are so grateful for everyone on this call and your partnership um, and really excited to keep continuing down this path and let's work together. Great, great stuff, Hannah. And love the, the bullets here about the call hub, the mobile teams, the crisis facilities, uh, you know, SAMHSA has reconceived these three things as someone to call. And just if you don't have your T-shirts, uh, the someone to call someplace, someone to come to you and someplace to go is on the back of one of our Crisis Jam T-shirts. Uh, uh, but I love, love this phrasing and all of the partners that are, that are referenced here. The media coverage of this is beginning to grow and steamroll. Uh, articles about quote unquote, are we ready? And some around the performance and capacity of building that out. Wall Street Journal uh, on July 11th had an article about reaching a counselor on the lifeline. Another article that same day on what is 988 behind the new mental health crisis lifeline number. And we have this situation where within the behavioral health community, we all know about it. Outside, many don't yet, but it's starting to steamroll and people are picking up on it. I came back from a two week vacation. My kids are restarting school and I got this link that I think every parent in, in my school district here got. It's, I don't recognize any of this, but it's all thoughtful, well done, that they pulled from somewhere. Uh, 988 differences with 911. Uh, there's a good Samaritan law in Arizona around calling 911. 
uh, you're not alone. So uh, it's just a viral movement. Uh, John Draper, we saw this with the, uh, the Lifeline uh, when it launched in 2004, 2005, uh, and we'll start to see this. Today's quote, a tweet from the Assistant Secretary from June 17th. On July 16th, the U.S. will transition to using the new 988 dialing code. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to strengthen and expand the existing Lifeline. 988 is a first step towards strengthening and transforming crisis care in this country. Uh, please welcome, if you will, our featured presenter today, uh, Assistant Secretary Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much, David, for the warm welcome. And, and uh, this is just a fantastic meeting. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that I actually joined a little bit early and was able to see the preview of the video. The t-shirts are awesome, I gotta say. <laughs> Love the t-shirts. Uh, and so just so appreciate this group and just the energy and passion that you have brought uh, to this meeting over the years. And so, you know, I, I'm just uh, grateful for the opportunity to be able to speak to everyone today. And um, we know with the uh, 988 transition right around the corner, uh, you know, certainly wanted to just also take the time just to recognize all the effort uh, and time and energy and passion uh, that this group uh, that you all have put into where we are today. You know, we often say that it, it truly takes all of us. And, and I think uh, our getting to this moment is a testament to the work that we have all done together. Um, and I'll share some of that in, in, the, uh, in the upcoming slides, you know, some of the impact of our work. Um, you know, I do want to share also a special, again, deep thanks to, um, to you, David, and, and Brian, and, you know, the entire uh, RI and Nashville team uh, for, for really for this institution. I, I remember this meeting was when I was a commissioner, uh, the Crisis Jam, and I love the name, too. <laughs> Uh, Crisis Jam has truly become an institution, and so just appreciate, uh, you know, your energy and, and sort of commitment there. Um, you know, I also want to say just a shout out to the many policymakers and partners uh, who are regulars, even on this call, uh, and who've put so much time and work uh, to advance the, the readiness of 988. Um, I also want to acknowledge, I, I understand, uh, Dr. Richard McEwen. Uh, uh, I've heard he is the JAM's most frequent attendee. So Richard, want to give you a shout out. <laughs> and I uh, also want to give just the entire 988 team. So Dr. Palmieri and the entire 988 team, just uh, uh, tremendous kudos and, and thanks for all their work and effort. I, I get to see them work daily behind the scenes and they are uh, you know, really just all in, all in it. And, and we are um, all about making this happen uh, with you all. So just excited about our, our ongoing partnership here. Um, so I'm going to, I have a few slides. I'm going to go through these and then really looking forward to our conversation and discussion. And you'll see the agenda there, what we'll go through. And um, next slide, this, this one is one of my favorite. I know you've all seen this one before. Um, and, you know, this just highlights just the array of broad reaching and ranging partners um, that have been part of this uh, journey, uh, you know, with us together. And, you know, you'll see it's a wide array of public, private, nonprofit partners uh, that you all have helped us to convene. Uh, we know that we certainly couldn't have pulled off this massive uh, convening effort without the leadership again of everyone here. And, and so I'm just really, really appreciative. And, and I know the SAMHSA team, we are just really, really appreciative um, of everyone's work and, and effort as we move towards this transition. Uh, next slide. So, you know, before we highlight some of the progress that I'm, I'm really looking forward to share, I just want to talk a little bit about sort of um, and, and review where we've come from. Uh, and you know where we were 18 months ago. Um, we know that while the Lifeline uh, served as a, just an invaluable resource, the Lifeline works, we know that it's been an invaluable resource. Um, but in terms of where we were 18 months ago, for example, we know we had no 988 uh, dedicated team or coordinating office. Um, we also had federal funding that was right around 24 million for the entire country. So just 24 million, you'll see some of the increases. Um, we had lower text and chat, uh, you know, lower rates uh, for calls, text and chats. Uh, and we hadn't done the number and level of convenings that we've done as well. Um, in the next few slides, you'll see, you know, to some of our accomplishments and where we are now. And it's just such a testament, again, to everyone's partnership and collaboration. And, and, and we're just ever grateful. 
Um, next slide. So, you know, with, your, with, with this team and this group's help, you know, last fall, uh, we did set forth two overarching goals. And these were to, you know, remember strength of the lifeline and also the longer term goal of really transforming the entire crisis um, continuum and system. Uh, we also outlined four near term priorities, if you'll remember, and I'll speak about some of the, the progress we've made in each of these areas. Uh, but the four pri near term priorities were, again, federal planning and convening, um, operational readiness of the lifeline network, uh, messaging and communication. We know that's so important. Uh, and also a foundation for comprehensive crisis services. Um, I do see a hand up and I'm, I'm entirely okay with taking questions uh, uh, as we go through if that works. And so uh, uh, Joyce, I see your hand. Not sure if that's an accidental hand or if that is a, a question that you're looking to, uh, would like to ask now. Okay, so I'll keep going, I'll keep going. We'll definitely have time for questions at the end because I, I don't have, uh, I definitely will make sure I leave that time. Um, so next slide. So in the next set of slides, I'm just so thrilled to be able to share just all the accomplishments um, that have occurred over the last, you know, really since the fall. Um, but as you'll see, you know, in terms of uh, federal planning, uh, the Biden-Harris administration has truly prioritized uh, mental health, and that is evident with the funding. We've seen an 18-fold increase uh, in resources. And so going from 24 million to now 432 million. Um, I'm also especially proud, as I mentioned, of the 988 uh, team and coordinating office. And again, the team is just working around the clock to, uh, to help uh, uh, move forward this transition. Uh, and then in terms of operational readiness, you know, in terms of operational readiness, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to do this justice because we know there's so much work that's happening in this space uh, simultaneously. Uh, but, you know, we've worked closely with Vibrant uh, and centers across the country, really, to operationalize the 282 million funding uh, that was released a few months ago. Um, we've also made a huge push towards uh, the backup call, text, and chats. You know, that has definitely been a priority uh, in terms of... Uh, you know, putting in place and, and enhancing the backup capacity, um, which, which we've done. And now, in fact, we have additional capacity to answer tens of thousands of uh, additional contacts. Um, and then we've also brought in and, you know, connected with just a broad array of partners as well, um, including FCC, the VA, uh, US Digital Service, uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure uh, Security Agency, uh, and these are just a few of, of the partners that we've connected with. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, in terms of national messaging, I mean, this is definitely an area that we know will be an ongoing area of work. And I just wanna give a, a few shout outs. I won't go through everything, but a few, a few key shout outs here. Uh, you know, for, for those of you ha who haven't seen it, um, do check out the 988 Partner Toolkit. Uh, this is an incredible resource. I mean, it is so rich. And in fact, it's, it's changing uh, regularly with additional resources that are added to it. Uh, but again, the Partner Toolkit, also developed in collaboration, uh, it includes FAQs, um, branding guidance, printable materials. So materials that could be printed out and used on social media or, or other places. Uh, and then also digital shareables, which were recently added as well. And so do take a look at that because we're continually adding additional resources there. Um, the other thing we're really proud of, and, and you know, we launched the 988 Jobs webpage. And again, the goal here was to be able to disseminate information far and wide about the jobs that are available across the 200 crisis call centers. And, uh, and so appreciated people letting us know that this was an area uh, where additional assistance and, and that something like this would help. And so now this is up and we've been working to disseminate this far and wide. And so I encourage everyone to uh, to send out this link as well if you haven't already uh, to let folks know about the jobs that are, that are available. Um, and then we also recently launched, we're excited about this, uh, a formative research project with the Action Alliance uh, uh, for suicide prevention. And the goal of this formative project is really to better understand, you know, knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, help-seeking behaviors of high-risk audiences. 
Um, and this will be helpful on so many fronts in terms of messaging, uh, in terms of other strategies and interventions we can put in place to get the word out, um, and to be able to sure, ensure that the messaging that we're getting out is culturally congruent and culturally responsive. So really excited about that collaboration and that partnership. Um, and so then, of course, in terms of the um, foundation, we know that 988 uh, is really the entry point, uh, ultimately just the entry point for a broader crisis continuum. Um, and we're continually working with our federal partners um, around how to move the needle, really, on uh, mobile crisis and crisis stabilization. Uh, we know that that will be an area of ongoing work moving forward. And in fact, we've developed a five-year vision uh, related to these aspirational targets. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about this at, at the end of the discussion as well. Uh, next slide. So now, you know, elaborating on, on some of what I shared earlier, I do want to, uh, to highlight uh, some of the specific accomplishments uh, when we compare, for example, June uh, 2021 to June 2022, there have been tremendous increases uh, and, and improvements when we look at uh, calls, texts, and chats. Uh, and so, for example, there have been um, 17,000 additional uh, calls, uh, 37,000 additional chats, and uh, 10,000 additional texts that have been responded to and answered. So uh, already we're seeing life-saving impacts in terms of the increased um, connection and vo uh, volume uh, and, and people being connected, uh, whether it be through calls, texts, or chats. Next slide. So I also want to share some of the uh, tremendous improvements that we've seen uh, in terms of some of the other lifeline core, core metrics uh, along the lines of calls, texts, and chats. Again, comparing 2021 to 2022. Um, we've seen the greatest increase in, in terms of chats and texts. And so uh, in particular, for example, uh, you know, with chats, the average speed to answer improved by 365%, um, you know, 365%. So for nine minutes uh, compared to uh, 2.5 minutes now, uh, or chats answered the, the improvement 148%. Uh, so for example, 25,000 uh, versus now 61,000 uh, chats answered. Uh, and then in terms of uh, uh, chats, the, uh, the answer rate, uh, that is improved by 200%. So a 31% answer rate versus a 72% answer rate. Um, so you see just significant increases in terms of people connecting. Uh, similar trends in terms of the text, average speed to answer, about 305% increase. Uh, text answer in terms of just the number, 77% increase. And then the answer rate improved by 52% for text. So uh, significant increases there. And you know, I just wanna commend and, and have to commend everyone uh, on this line who's connected to any of these call centers or work that uh, or sites that are doing this work uh, because already again, we're seeing impacts. Uh, next slide. So in terms of the, the communication plans uh, for the July transition, you know, much of this work is well underway and in fact has been, uh, you know, ongoing. Um, but in the coming weeks, you know, we anticipate that our key objectives will be, you know, essentially highlighting the progress and manage the expectations uh, about this transformative change. And, and we all likely have been involved in some of those conversations where we're doing some of that work already in terms of managing uh, some of the expectations. And in a moment, I'll share some of the top, the top line messaging that we're using there in terms of, uh, you know, expectations, you know, switching, for example, to the idea of transition as opposed to a launch. Um, that this is an ongoing process as opposed to sort of a, uh, an endpoint where you, you flip the switch and, and uh, we're going to be, uh, you know, at the end point of where we want to be. Um, we know it's going to be a process, you know, a critical change like this and system change we know takes a process. But nevertheless, it's been a process where we've seen really tremendous and quick uh, impacts and changes. Um, we also want to ultimately be able to shine light on the life-saving work uh, that the crisis centers are doing. Um, and then to continue to strengthen the 988 work so, workforce. Um, so here there'll be opportunities, and certainly we're interested in sharing success stories. You know, I think that they are often so powerful, and uh, and even you know some of the the video that was shared at, at the at the top of this, you know, just before this, um, just sharing the impact of and the value 
of the of the crisis call centers and the crisis work that's happening, I think will go a long way and and, and also help to get the word out. Um, continuing to support states and territories, and then of course building uh, awareness and understanding of 988. Uh, and then you'll see the tactics that, uh, that we'll be using related to these areas. Uh, next slide, please. Great. Um, and then in terms of some of the top lines uh, that I talked about, um, these are some of the ones that we've been using and, and we'll make sure that, that these are in the uh, toolkit if they're not in there already. Uh, but just in terms of you know, consistent messaging and we've shared these across departments. And you know, we often talk about, for example, that uh, you know, 988, they will offer 24 seven access uh, to people who are experiencing you know, suicidal, but also substance use and other mental health crises. Um, we'll often share, share information about the level of investments and the investments that have been made uh, at the federal level. Um, and then often we'll share about just the level of change and impact that we're already seeing, um, already seeing even before the launch. Um, and then we often talk about you know, the, the long-term success uh, that ultimately this will need to continue to be um, a, a process where we're all collaborating together and we're all sort of moving towards, uh, you know, a fully enhanced crisis continuum uh, in, in a collaborative way and, and uh, working together towards that goal. Next slide. So I wanted to share a little bit about, um, about how you all can continue to help and, and know that we so great, greatly appreciate uh, just the level of collaboration. I can't say it enough, uh, the level of collaboration and ways in which we've all been working together already. Um, but some ways, additional ways are, you know, to continue to amplify the top line messages. And again, we'll make sure that they're in your toolkit and that everybody has those. Um, for example, to continue to use uh, the partner toolkit, which just has a wealth of information and that we'll continue to add valuable resources there as those um, as we're able to get those out. And you know, now the digital, share, digital shareables are part of that toolkit as well. Um, also to continue to spread the word about the 988 jobs website uh, and the jobs that are uh, still needing to be filled. That's something that we're, we're working on, on an ongoing basis. So really could use help with continuing to get that, that link out there. Um, and then, you know, continue to let us know about what, what will help or what questions you have or concerns you have or ideas that you have. Know that we are open, uh, open to receive those and, and to work with you all around um, advancing things that will, will make a difference and make an impact. Next slide, please. You know, so I just wanted to end with this, with this vision and, and sort of one final thought. And, you know, what you'll see here is just a high level, it's, it's a high level vision for the crisis services um, that I referenced earlier. Uh, and again, that, that many of you all are sort of steeped in and, and are part of, and, you know, we see this as a, as a bold vision uh, with ambitious targets, you know, with ambitious targets over time. Um, and ultimately the, the vision is that over years, so over the, the next set of years, um, that we'll be able to develop this continuum that has these various horizons that you'll see um, and that we'll be able to work towards sustaining the continuum and continuing to build the, um, the momentum. You know, certainly I, I can envision this crisis jam being a critical part of that momentum, you know, just having a, a space where, where everyone can sort of get together and share ideas and, and sort of what's happening. And so that certainly um, would love to see and, and uh, you know, this space continue as well. Um, but, but I'll end there. And again, just want to thank everyone for the partnership, for your ideas, for your energy. Uh, again, David and Brian for creating this space uh, and for the invitation for me to be able to come and share. You know, David and I talked a, a couple, maybe a month ago or so, and I let her know I'm, I'm so looking forward to be able to come and, and connect with you all and just um, acknowledge and honor and, and thank you for the work that, that you've all been doing as, as we're moving towards and working towards this combined goal. Uh, the shared goal and shared vision. So, uh, so thank you. So good, we have time for questions. I hope I didn't go through that too quickly, but looking forward for it to uh, any discussion or questions folks may have. Terrific, Please. Dr. Duffin Rittman. And thank you so much for your tireless uh, and fearless leadership of you and the SAMHSA team over these last many years. Uh, we're gonna talk more about that. And please do put your questions uh, for Dr. Duffin Rittman into the text chat. We're going to start with some comments from some of the, the key partners on this effort. Uh, and there's been an unprecedented relationship with the federal and state leaders with Brian Hepburn and Nash. But Dr. Hepburn, your reflections. 
Thank you, David, and uh, thank you, Assistant Secretary Miriam Delphin Rittman. Uh, your leadership and your SAMHSA team have moved the 988 effort forward across the country. Every state is using the SAMHSA national uh, guidelines for on behavioral health crisis care. Every state is using the SAMHSA 988 playbooks. Your inclusiveness of behavioral health organizations and stakeholders in the planning of 988 is very much appreciated. Uh, we know there's much to do. We are excited. We're energized by your leadership. Again, thank you. David, send us our t-shirts. <laughs> On the way. Colleen Carr, the Action Alliance has been such a catalyzer of collective impact and SAMHSA's leadership early on in that. Your reflections. Yeah, thanks, David. It's so exciting to think about how far we've come in such a short time. Um, you know, I'm thinking in back to 2015 when we asked our XCOM partners to make written commitments as to what they were going to do to advance the national strategy next. And you wrote on the card, we're going to do for crisis services what we just did for zero suicide. And um, every, uh, it took a little convincing of some folks in the room, um, but before you knew it, there was an Action Alliance Crisis Now Task Force. A year later, the report came out, an important precursor to the SAMHSA guidelines, a congressional briefing, and, um, and then a phone call from Capitol Hill about this three-digit number that they were considering. Um, and it really just accelerated all of these really important conversations about how a three-digit number could be an important part of of overall crisis services transformation, um, the need for a block grant set aside and all the work, Brian, that you've done with the commissioners to activate. Um, it really just, it's almost overwhelming to think about how all of these different pieces have all come together in such a quick time um, and the progress that we have in, in such just a few years. Um, so I'm, you know, a week out, I'm really um, energized by it and also humbled by all the work still do. Uh, so I just want to thank you guys for the leadership of the jam and everyone who's continuing to show up every week and sharing your expertise and your wisdom and your ideas and for your leadership to shepherd us into the 988 era. And I know it takes all of the public and private sector partners working together. And uh, we're just really glad to uh, be part of the journey. Wow, uh, Colleen, thinking about the Napolitano CATCO uh, 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 congressional briefing that you hosted and so many partners on this call who've made such an impact. Uh, but Chuck and Golia, uh, thinking about the National Council, you put forth a crisis track back in, gosh, that's been at least 2016, 2017, 2018 uh, at the National Council Conference. Your reflections? Well, David, as, first of all, just thank you to you and uh, you know, this call is such representative of why we've made so much progress, right? Working together as a community, various levels of government, providers, different sectors, joining together around a vision to make sure that everyone has someone to talk to, someone to respond in a safe place to go for help. And National Council members are so proud to be part of this effort. And I think really the opportunity we have, right, is to go from a series of crisis services to a coordinated system of crisis care. And that's what excites me and our members. And I know many of the people on this call, we're just so grateful to SAMHSA's leadership to be part of this movement, to be able to offer hope to people at some of their darkest days. And what great timing that Congress and the administration is now prioritizing the national expansion of certified community behavioral health clinics, because we got to meet, we got to match that vision with resources and services. And we're just so excited to be part of this, David. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chuck. Uh, Dr. John Draper, uh, the work that uh, coming out of the mental health disaster response of 9 11 into the lifeline, and here we are today at the starting line. Uh, your reflections. Amen, David. We've come a long, long way. It's a very transformational time. In fact, um, Dr. Delphin Rittman, who again, I'm, we are so thankful for SAMHSA's support and delivering the kind of, of funding that crisis centers have been needing for years to make a difference. And she was just talking about numbers for chat and text services earlier in, in this presentation to give you a sense of how rapidly evolving this transformation is based on the resources that SAMHSA has provided us. 
uh, we just this last week are answered 100% of our texts in approximately two minutes and 92% of our chats. That gives you a sense of, and it was about, a, about the beginning of the year in the low 20%. So that's how quickly transformation can happen when crisis services are properly resourced. So many thanks to, to SAMHSA for that. But I, I really want to, to, to note that just kind of from a, a, a pressing the rewind perspective, um, that we have come a long way. And we, we, when, when we first started administering this service back in 2004, I was determined to make sure that this National Suicide Prevention Service would be one that was truly community owned. And it was first and foremost about a community of crisis centers and it would be guided by a community of national advisors and the three national committees of experts in suicide prevention evaluation and practice, persons with lived expertise in suicidality and sui suicide loss, public mental health influ influencers, decision makers. We wanted to make sure we had national partners, SAMHSA, Nashville, National Council, all working with us in tandem to build a community of care. And boy, I look around now, and as Chuck was just saying, and, and as uh, Dr. Delphin Rippen was noting, look at what we have now. We have a transformation in terms of community commitment. I, I'm, I'm so heartened by the work that's been done over the last few years and bring galvanizing the community around 988 to bring together people who never really were talking about crisis services before, but now are investing in them and people who are stepping up to the plate and doing whatever they can to advocate for them and people who are providing services in ways that they never have before. And all of that has been made possible by a three digit number. And David, this particular convening here, as Chuck was saying, is very much the embodiment of what this community of care has become. How diverse it is, how committed it is, and, and how talented we are, especially all together. Uh, so it's just a privilege to be with you, David, hosting this, uh, this amazing group of people RI has created a home for everyone to come and talk and meet, just as Dr. Delvin Ritten was saying. And the ability to look ahead now and be hopeful about 988 is so incredibly bright because when you have a community that, this, that is this committed and dedicated, it ain't going away. We're going to build that crisis care continuum that we've been dreaming of. It's going to take some time, but this community commitment is only growing. And it's great to be a part of it. And it's also great to be a part of our community of crisis centers who are arguably, well, they used to be on the periphery of the mental health system. And now, arguably, they are the front door for the National Behavioral Health Crisis Care System. So it is an honor to be a part of this in this historic time. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. And by the way, have you all heard the news that this weekend, hope has a new number? <laughs> love, love it, John. Love it. And That's look, awesome. this learn this learning community is not a one-way direction. It's a everyone contributing in, which is part of the speed. Uh, and this this you know, it's a starting line uh, that Dr. Duffin Rittman has talked about, and she's laid out this vision. I'm not sure there's a finish line. Uh, the first 999 number was called in 1937, and 911 is still improving today to get faster, better response to people with a medical emergency. We're going to speed our collective impact as we work together. So Hope has a new number. Love it, Dr. John Love Draper. Uh, Dr. Delphin Rittman, any final reflections before we transition to our crisis trivia hot seat? Yeah, you know, um, I also love, you know, John, the hope has a new number. <laughs> That's uh, I could see that on a T-shirt as well. Um, but, you know, again, just want to thank everyone for the partnership, for the collaboration. Look forward to continuing to, to be on this journey uh, together with everyone. I think, you know, this is a transition, as we've talked about. We have a lot more work to do. Uh, we know that a, a long range goal is around the, you know, strengthening the, the full continuum. And so really looking forward to, to working with everyone on that. Um, and again, just want to thank everyone uh, for, for all the work to get us to this point. Uh, and, and so uh, also appreciate the invitation to be here as well. So thank you. Great. Thank you. And Karen, let's make sure we get Dr. Delphin Rittman, her choice of T-shirt. Just two, two decisions. Becky, you've got to make the same. 
You need a color, uh, English or Spanish. I guess it's three decisions and a quote. It's a game changer when people care. Amy Brinkley from Nashville. Crisis care shouldn't come in a police car. Ron Bruno from CIT International. Someone to call, someone to, go, uh, someone to come and somewhere to go. Uh, Anita Everett's original conceptualization of the SAMHSA guidelines core elements and turning hardship into hope from Secretary Becerra. But Becky Stoll, welcome to the Crisis Trivia Hot Seat. Hey, David. Uh, so Becky, you're a uh, lead for crisis and disaster response at Centerstone, a longtime leader in the industry. And, and Becky, uh, you've been here for many of these uh, uh, discussions. It was Thanksgiving in 2016 when the idea to advance a national three-digit hotline for behavioral health and suicidal crises materialized with a specialized response pattern in part on 911. Who was the individual who suggested a national approach was needed? And we've got, uh, if all of you in the audience can pick, FCC Commissioner Ajit Pai, SAMHSA's Branch Chief, Dr. Richard McKeon, Crisis Now co-lead, Dr. Michael Hogan, or Utah Senator Orrin Hatch. And you can see the audience is answering. Uh, we've got people weighing in on I know all this of one, those. David. Uh, Richard is making a run at Orrin Hatch. He's growing right now. Uh, Mike's got a fair uh, percentage there as well, uh, the FCC commissioner. Uh, Becky, you may know this yourself. You may want to phone a friend. What's, what's your thinking here, Becky? I, I think I'm, I'm pretty confident I know the answer uh, is, is D, Utah Senator Orrin Hatch. Yeah, you know, uh, and Becky, look, uh, all of these are titans in the uh, formulation of getting where we're at. Ajit Pai shocked all of us in the field with 988. And Becky, you were the first one who said, hold on, everybody. He was all, we were all sort of, what's going on here? We wanted 611. We wanted 211. And, and Becky, you were really quick. You said, hey, let's come together behind this number. Uh, give, give us 30 seconds on that, Becky. Yeah, I mean, our, you know, this is going to be a glorious day on Saturday. We all worked really hard across the industry to get this thing over the line. And I think for a long time, we kept referring to it as an N11 number. Uh, and, you know, John and I and some others uh, from AFSP and Lauren Conaboy, our, our VP of policy, went and met with Chairman Pai. And uh, they came back with us with, you know, what, what I said, we were looking at the children's menu and who knew if we flipped the menu over, we could get the adult menu. And that was a nine, a number that started with nine, which was really just unprecedented. Uh, and so it felt like that train was going to move and, and we all needed to jump on it and, and, and look at where we are two years later. And also, David, I, I think we should all duly note when we were having those conversations that long ago, who knew who could have fathomed that we would be doing this in a global pandemic? Yeah. yeah never, right. never crossed anyone's mind. Yeah, as well as the unprecedented discussions of race and equity and those three things together, Becky. So yeah. Becky, you, can you see the answers on the screen? I cannot. Uh, Karen, oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, uh, FCC Commissioner Jeep Pai, we've referenced Richard's decades of uh, a persistent tenacious leadership around this. Mike's formulation of the base of much of this uh, 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 inspired by the Colorado effort when they looked at the uh, work in Georgia and Arizona. Uh, but the answer here is in fact, Becky uh, hit it dead on. Uh, State Senator Daniel Thatcher uh, was having pecan pie on Thanksgiving with um, uh, Senator Orrin Hatch and uh, frustrated about uh, advancing a three-digit mental health substance use suicidal crisis line in Utah when Orrin Hatch said you're thinking too small. So all of these uh, leaders. So Becky, uh, you've got a t-shirt coming. Uh, uh, so let us know uh, color, language, and quote. Thanks I so much. Will. Thanks so much to Becky. And speaking of Steve Ellison, uh, Steph, uh, your article interview for the week. Yep. So I'm so excited and it's perfect timing right after the hot seat. So we have representative Steve Eelson. Uh, he spent a good two hours chatting with me on the history of what led to 988. And 
it started really um, with Utah. Can you talk a little bit, uh, Representative Elison, what got you started and why you started thinking about a number, a three-digit number nationwide? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, me, myself and Senator Thatcher were working uh, together on a lot of mental health legislation. And after the, uh, the visit between Senator Hatch and uh, Senator Thatcher, um, we turned our efforts, uh, instead of trying to get a number in Utah, uh, we took that nationwide, which was, which was a bold move. Uh, as you mentioned in your article, my father used to always say, that's gonna take an act of Congress for something really hard. Well, thanks to the efforts of so many people, uh, Senator Hatch, uh, Congressman Stewart, we got that act of Congress and it was basically unanimous through the entire process. I think the last thing I'd like to say before passing it back to David is in the article, you know, sometimes legislators and readers uh, and people on the jam, they see where Utah is or another state like Arizona and Georgia, and they, they don't think about the incremental steps that it took to get there. And what I love about talking to you is that you really took me through Utah and all of the incremental steps that you took to get to where you are today. And, and that's a key component of why this article is so vital. So thank you. Thank you for all of your work. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, uh, Representative Ellison. We're going to come to State Senator Thatcher here at the end of the show and, and get an update on Utah. Uh, before we do that, uh, for our we've got a special uh, version of a legislative national legislative update today, and I'm going to kick that to Al Guida from Guide Consulting to uh, tee that up. Al, you're on mute. Mute. David, we are going to do a top ten sort of history of mental health. Number ten is uh, the Mental Health Parity Act of 1996. That was the first effort to achieve parity in the private health and insurance marketplace for uh, mental health and addiction treatment services. It kicked off one of the first full-blown mental health policy debates in the United States Senate, on the United States Senate floor. That night, it was April 1996, five or six U.S. senators on both sides of the aisle uh, shared their personal experience with mental illness, including suicide among staff and close family members. Oh, terrific, Al. Uh, this uh, top 10 setting the foundation for 988 comes in a partnership between Guide Consulting and AFSP, who've been our, our weekly partners on this. Laurel, uh, coming in at number nine. Yes, coming in at number nine, the 1999 Surgeon General, Dr. David Satcher's landmark report, a call to action to prevent suicide, declaring suicide as a major public health issue. Great. Uh, look, as we're going through these, Kristen mentioned it in the chat text. If you want a, a 988 t-shirt that you don't have to pay for and comes to you in your mailbox, then try to get out ahead of us. Mention something uh, that you think was key or one that we've left out that should have been mentioned. Let's go to number eight. Coming in at number eight is the 2001 HHS National Strategy for Suicide Prevention. This landmark document launched the organized effort to prevent suicide in the United States and activity in the field of suicide prevention really jumped, was at a jumping off point since this uh, 2001 strategy was issued. And I haven't been around long enough, Sarah, to know Jerry Reed, Dr. Jerry Reed, Dr. Richard McKeon were leads on the effort to revise that national strategy in 2012. Uh, someone put in the chat text who led the original 2001 uh, development. I, I don't really know, but let's go to number seven. All right, for number seven, we have the uh, creation of the National Suicide Prevention Hotline in 2003 with the floor amendment from State Senator Wellstone, uh, who was a champion for mental health, um, and it funded it at $3 million. Terrific, Joanna. Thank you so much. And at number six. David, the uh, representative Napolitano, who's a Democrat from California, her house backed up to a state psychiatric hospital in, in Southern California. She teamed with Representative uh, Tim Murphy, Republican from Pennsylvania, to revitalize the House Mental Health Caucus. That revitalization then laid the foundation for future uh, mental health developments in the House and the Senate over a period of at least a decade. Absolutely. Colleen, we're really thankful for 
uh, Napolitano's uh, leadership on this. Uh, and back to Laurel. Yes, and coming in at number five, we have the 2004 Hallmark Youth Suicide Prevention and Intervention Law, Garrett Lee Smith Memorial Act, championed by former Senator Gordon Smith, who lost his son to suicide. And at number four. Coming in at number four, the 2008 Wellstone and Domenici Mental Health Parity and Addiction Act. Uh, this was offered as a floor amendment to TARP legislation in 2008 and was an important step on in cheap, uh, achieving parity with physical health. Great, thank you, Sarah. Joanna. And coming in at number three is the passage of the Affordable Care Act of 2020, 2010, which included mental health as an essential benefit, um, as well as very critical mental health parity provisions. Great. And our final two, back to Al. David, coming in at number two, the passage of the Excellence in Mental Health Treatment Act, it created a 10 state Medicaid demonstration program of certified community behavioral health clinics under the leadership of the National Council for Mental Wellbeing. As Chuck noted, the Congress just passed legislation that would uh, permit that Medicaid demonstration to be rolled out nationwide. And Laurel. Yes, and drum roll, number one, the historic 2020 enactment of the National Suicide Hotline Designation Act, designating 988 as the new dialing code reaching the National Suicide Prevention and Mental Health Crisis Hotline System operated by the National Suicide um, Prevention Lifeline and is our collective moment for crisis care transformation. Great, thank you, Laurel. And again, put your ideas in the text chat. Uh, Karen, let's get a t-shirt to Ken Thompson referencing the Mental Health Peer Workforce Initiative as a foundation uh, for this work. But talking with John Palmieri and, and others, I was just we were thinking about some key ones that, that might also need to be referenced. Uh, John, uh, we felt like the 2007 Joshua Omvig Veteran Suicide Prevention Act uh, just had to be included. Yeah, David, agree completely uh, with, you know, highlighting the importance of suicide prevention for veterans and specifically including language uh, that sets up uh, the opportunity for a hotline to support uh, uh, veterans with suicide prevention services. Absolutely. And then referencing Dr. Jerry Reed, uh, Senator Harry Reed's lifetime of service to suicide prevention. Uh, John, you had some comments on uh, Senator Harry Reed. Yeah, I mean, I think really, you know, emphasizing the pioneering work that Senator Reid did with respect to suicide prevention, I think, was responsible for some very early resolutions which recognized suicide as a national priority, and then ultimately a resolution which uh, established uh, Survivors of Suicide Loss Day, uh, which uh, continues to be uh, recognized to this day. And just looking at this, again, so many different things, the crisis uh, block grant set aside, there are so many that, that could be referenced, but we felt uh, as we were finishing this presentation, we had to reference the uh, groundbreaking leadership of SAMHSA, which is now in its three decades of impact, the lifeline building on the original 1-800-SUICIDE and the national guidelines for behavioral health crisis care with those three fundamental core elements have really been uh, important. So uh, Richard, quick reflections on, uh, you were not only the, uh, Dr. Delphin Rittman referenced the most active participant in the crisis jam, but really the architect and founder of it and our very first meeting. So a quick reflection on the history and development. Sure. Um, the way the crisis jam came to be was that as the pandemic uh, began to escalate, in March of 2020, uh, there was concern that we had at SAMHSA um, you know, regarding the impact, of course, on mental health more generally, uh, but specifically on crisis services. So I consulted with Dr. Anita Everett, and we agreed that we would start a call and try to get key people in crisis services together so that we could assess what kind of impact the pandemic was happening, was having. And of course, it was having an, an impact in a number of different ways, including um, uh, reduction in face-to-face -face mobile crisis visits, um, lack of availability of inpatient beds uh, because they could accept fewer people 
in order to accommodate social distancing. Um, but we were heartened that the basic structure of crisis services was remaining intact and we were sharing information. And that was really the main focus for the first several months. And then David, it was you using your superb entrepreneurial skills who took what we had started and really uh, transformed it into what we know today. Um, you know, so um, I may have been instrumental in starting it, but you have certainly been instrumental um, in growing it to what it is today. Well, thanks so much, Richard. There were 20 or 30 of us involved in that pivot. And Dr. Brian Hepburn was really the one who leveraged the growth with all 50 states, uh, offices of mental health joining in. Uh, let's go to Megan uh, and a quick uh, ref, uh, a reflection from the NASHBID and this unprecedented state federal partnership. Yeah, this has been absolutely inspiring. Um, the leadership and reflecting upon it is, is just absolutely amazing. And as we uh, implement 988 and get ready for 988 and launch 988, we always want to uh, be thinking about race and equity, uh, which David, you had mentioned, uh, you had said someone to talk to, someone to respond in a safe place to help for help. I, um, I just think that is so fantastic. And we really want to address that related to underserved populations, people at not only um, you know, BIPOC populations, but also people with IDD, people who are deaf. Um, NASHBID has developed recommendations around people who are deaf and hard of hearing and consulted with the deaf community about what those recommendations should be. And one of those key recommendations is to have a national center uh, for people who are deaf and hard of hearing that can call into uh, and have ASL fluent counselors that direct service. And so uh, we really uh, promote that, want that. And also there are just unique needs for people who are IDD. I do wanna put in the chat box, the uh, state territories and tribes playbook, which has an equity section that talks about IDD and deaf populations, as well as the actual recommendations for deaf communities for 988. So please check those out, thank you. Oh, and Megan, thanks so much for your leadership uh, around these key areas. Uh, we started with NAMI. Uh, we're going to sort of conclude there. Uh, Steph Pasternak, the uh, work of, of the dashboard to track uh, legislative efforts. A quick word on your thoughts uh, going into this next round. Uh, wh wh where does NAMI go from here in supporting this work? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, so, of course, tracking state legislation has certainly been an evolution over the last year. Um, and ultimately, we decided with our dashboard tool to really track states' progress in passing some of those core components of NASHBID's 988 model bill um, about defining 988 services, setting up sustainable funding and system oversight. Um, and of course, you can see on the map um, in gray, uh, many states have not yet acted, um, but I will say moving forward, um, we should see states really gain a, a greater understanding and what kind of policy and funding changes they need to really achieve the full vision of, of 988. So expect 20, the rest of 2022 and 2023 to be very active with state legislation. Great, Steph. Uh, we've done these state stats cards highlighting the states who passed comprehensive legislation or really substantial funding uh, brought to the table in, in, in the case of Utah. Uh, let's have, we just got about a minute each for uh, Lisa. Uh, let's start with Lisa. Lisa, uh, biggest learning so far in the, the work in Virginia? Lisa Job Shields. Hi, yes. Um, the, the collaboration is key and, it, and it, it takes everybody coming together and many funding streams to really, to really make it all work. So we, we just couldn't be more thankful to have our um, legislators and our administration um, and, and our, I'll pass it to my Medicaid partner um, all working together on yeah, this. Yeah, so Dr. Alyssa Ward, uh, biggest uh, reflection in the go forward. Definitely have learned to appreciate the power of rates and, and service definitions and moving this process forward in Medicaid and are happy to have uh, the 12.5% increase that we got through 
ARPA funds this year for community-based services extended through our legislature, and that applies to uh, our crisis services. So we're happy to get that uh, get that going and get extra rate support out there to these Paul providers Paul is going to do a dance around rates <laughs> and definitions. Uh, 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 State Senator uh, Daniel Thatcher, uh, biggest reflection on learnings in Utah so far? Well, if I've only got a minute, let me go really, really fast. First and foremost, commissions are key. Uh, when we first ran this bill back in 2014, uh, there was so much pushback. It was such a radical idea to have a three-digit number that we ended up having to backpedal and we settled for a commission. And so that commission was able to then bring all the disparate parties together so that instead of everybody rowing in their own direction, we were all in the same boat, all right. paddling the same way. And that's, I think, how we got to, to where we were. A um, couple of things I want to highlight. Look, I love that we're down from nine minutes to two and a half minutes, but two and a half minutes is an eternity for someone who is suicidal. Um, as someone who struggles with suicide ideation myself, I will tell you, when you are in that dark space, three seconds feels like 10 minutes. Yeah. And so I feel like, like we really need to zero in uh, because we need a 100% answer rate. It, it, we would never tolerate 911 going unanswered. And that, I believe, is the standard that we need to hold 988 to. It needs to be uh, the, the same. There are a million things that we did in Utah that I would love to see nationwide, like peer counseling, a, a law enforcement officer, somebody who is struggling is more likely to talk to somebody. A firefighter is going to talk to somebody who knows what it's like to be on fire. They don't want to talk to you know, a, a young 20 something therapist who just got her license. Um, peer counseling is critical, CIT standards. We had some real tragic losses because one of our largest police departments decided to do their own CIT standards, which didn't uh, raise to the level. We had, we had an autistic kid shot because a CIT officer wasn't a real CIT officer. Uh, behavioral EMS is a total game changer. We don't have enough social workers, so getting the mental health training equivalent certification like an EMT has for, for physical health is phenomenal. And, and I, I, I'm anxious for other states to catch on what Utah's doing there. Um, man, receiving centers, Elison deserves so much credit. Representative Elison for, for getting receiving centers and pushing the MCOTs here in Utah. It's, it's been amazing. We all need to push for parity. Um, and safe UT. Man, I wish that I had three hours to talk to you guys about this app that we have through all of our schools. We are to the point where we now have roughly 10% of our junior high and high school population using this app over a 13 month period. I don't know why we don't do a year, but I'm, I'm including 13 for transparency's sake. But Senator Thatcher, months, thank you. So, we we got to move, move. I, I know, I know, we got to go. But this this app, roughly 10% of our kids are using this app to text in and get help every year. And that is incredible. Um, so I would love to follow up with anybody who's interested in learning how, how to do this. It also allows tips. We have had 421 weapons, explosives, or planned school attacks intervened and intercepted in the state of Utah, 421 in a 13-month period. Great. Thank you so much. Stephanie Woodard, just a quick uh, a couple of words around uh, what you've learned in, in Nevada. Sure. Thank you, David. Um, it's so exciting to be part of this, having been part of some of the initial uh, crisis jam meetings. Uh, Nevada collaboration is key. I think someone else had already said that. Um, it takes a lot of hands um, to make the lift for 988. Um, and based on our uh, recent projections, this is a new revenue stream for our legislation uh, that will be bringing in approximately $19 million uh, so that we will be able to support ongoing 988 operations and fully fund the crisis cascade of care uh, for mobile crisis and crisis stabilization. So uh, from Nevada, we keep saying we're really just getting started. Terrific, Stephanie. And uh, our final word, uh, Rep Orwall, you're, you know, the Beatles song that uh, you're inspired by to, for, from yeah. today's jab. Well, and I tell you, it's a 1968 song. It was written by John Lennon, and he wrote it for someone running to be California governor. And they liked the title, but they didn't like the lyrics, and that has come together. And that is what this jam has done. And the federal leaders, 
world and everyone in Washington state has come together. So thank you. And my big learn is for less than a penny a day, the residents of Washington have purchased our three call lines hiring over 120 people, a 980 tribal line and getting the text line up and running. We couldn't have done it without that fee, which I think is mental health parity. And now we're working on our teams and our, our 23 hour facilities. And we got a lot of work ahead, but thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Rep Orwell, for your leadership. And, and John Palmieri, I'm going to lose the challenge. It was, could I land the plane safely on time and get John Franklin Sierra in? We're going to get John Franklin Sierra in, our three-time uh, Crisis Jam featured presenter. Uh, Dr. John Franklin Sierra, a quick, uh, in, instead of referencing either the LA County Crisis Design or the calculator, uh, your, your reflection uh, from a systems design standpoint on, on our work going forward. Uh, just, you know, how critical all of the planning here has been, all of the, you know, just modeling, you talk about tools, you know, I say all models are wrong, but some are useful. I think so many folks on this call have really leaned into that and leaned into an understanding that the system design needs to make sense and it needs to work for everybody and structure matters, um, as I have said. And so I'm heartened by how seriously everyone has taken this exercise of designing a good system to meet the needs of folks here. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing how it continues to play out. Thank you so very much. Uh, uh, I'm gonna uh, skip over and go straight to the uh, uh, Next week is Dr. Michael Allen and Bev Marquez from the Colorado system. Uh, and look, uh, life's too short not to have a big purpose. Uh, and what a joy to be doing this work together as we start down this path with nine at eight. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to SAMHSA and Dr. Delphin Rittman. And we hope to see you next week.